Hey guys, um, so I wanted to talk about an application of Taylor series to a physics problem where we'll look at the motion of a simple pendulum with no air friction. It's a it's an idealized situation, but um, it's a really good problem to study. So what do I mean by a simple pendulum? Well, I have a massless rod hanging from the ceiling and it's attached to a weighted bob. So this is my bob, has some weight to it. And then this is a massless rod or string. And so one physical variable that we can define here is the angular displacement theta of the bob from the vertical. Something else that we can talk about is also the length of the massless rod, and this is going to be in green here. This is going to be L. So L is the length of the rod or the string. And that is all. We have a gravitational force on the bob and then a tension force on the bob as well. So let's draw a free body diagram. So my bob is going to be floating as a free body right here. And then what forces do I have acting on this bob? I have the gravitational force Mg and then the tension force T because the, um, the bob is holding on to the rod, right? It's the, the two are attached together. So now, um, well, I've already drawn my forces, but I need to have some sort of um, coordinate system. So let's make this my X, my Y, my coordinate system is tilted. And because I'm also thinking about theta, I need to figure out what theta is. So theta is the angle between the vertical and the tension. And so the vertical line here that I have is the uh, vertical line formed by mg. So this is going to be my angle theta. These are um, corresponding um, corresponding angles, right? Because the negative y axis continues on from tension. And so that would be the same as this tension force here. And uh, the vertical is given to me by the mg. So that's my... Um, these are my forces. Okay. Um, now let's think about, well, let's break apart my gravitational force into X and Y components. So I'm going to redraw it and I'm going to break it apart because it is a vector as an X and Y component. So it forms a right triangle and this is MG the magnitude of um, my gravitational force and also the length of that hypotenuse. And here is the angle theta. And this length on the right hand side, that's um, cosine of theta, right? And then I multiply by the hypotenuse. So I get mg cos theta. Okay. And then this downward looking, <laughs> um, force, it's going to be the opposite of theta, so it's going to be mg sine theta. So now my gravitational force is broken down into two pieces along the x and y directions, and my vertical is um, going along here, and the horizontal goes along here. Okay, let's do summation of forces. Mm. We would probably do this in both direction, but but we can just do the x direction right now. So the sum of forces. So let's start by summing the forces in the x direction. That is easy because I only have one force in the um, tilted x direction with the coordinate systems that I have, and that's mg sine theta. Now notice that the center of the coordinate system is at the bob, which is right here, and mg sine theta is pointing to the left along um, my negative x-axis. So it's going to be negative mg sine theta. 
Um, and theta is a function of time, right? Because it's changing as the bob is moving back and forth. Um, we'll get to the Taylor polynomial in just a second. <laughs> Um, this is the summation of the forces, and by Newton's second law, we know that this is equal to mass times acceleration, so ma. And what do we know? We know that theta and a, they're functions of time. So to understand what's happening in the system, I have to figure out what this acceleration is and what my theta is, right? That's the kind of the basic question. So what is... A of t and theta of t. Okay. So the equation that I have so far from the summation of forces in the x direction is negative mg sine theta of t is equal to m times a of t. Now this a of t is a linear acceleration I think it's also called the tangential acceleration. But theta is an angular quantity, so we want to transform the linear acceleration to an angular acceleration because that's going to be given to me in terms of theta. So how do I do that? Um, that's, that's an expression that we end up learning. Um, but we do want angular acceleration. which is in terms of theta. And so A of T is equal to L multiplied by the second derivative of theta with respect to time, where the second derivative with respect to time of theta is my angular acceleration. So this is just a substitution. Where does this come from? I'm guessing you maybe have seen this already. Um, but essentially, this comes from the equation s is equal to r theta, right? So s is my arc length. So if I have an object moving along an arc, the um, distance that the object travels is the arc length, and it's given to me by the angle that the object travels through and the radius. Thinking back to my bob, this bob travels in an arc, and the radius of my arc is the distance away from the, um, what is it, the pivot? <laughs> and that is the distance L, the length of the rod or the string. And then theta is also um, that angular displacement. So once I take two derivatives of both sides, um, the second derivative of arc length turns into linear acceleration. Um, R or L is a constant, and then two derivatives of the angle with respect to time. This gives me the angular acceleration. So we don't necessarily need to do to know that, but um, it helps me make the transition to all theta variables. So I have negative mg sine theta of t is equal to m times l times the second derivative of theta with respect to time. And now let's simplify. My m's cancel out. I'm going to put the l on the other side and I have negative g over l times sine theta. I'm just going to drop the time dependency now um, just because it's, uh, it takes some time to write. And then I have the second derivative of theta with respect to time. And this is my equation. So from this, the only thing I don't know is theta, right? So that helps me. Before I needed to know the linear acceleration in theta, here I just need to know theta. And what I have here is an equation involving the derivatives of theta, such that when I take two derivatives of theta, I should be get, getting a constant, a negative constant out times sine of that function theta. And so that's pretty darn complicated, and we want to simplify this a bit, which is where we have a Taylor polynomial approximation coming in. And because a sine is what's screwing us up, because it's a trigonometric function, this is what we're going to go for. 
So sine of theta, I'm going to use a Maclaurin series. K goes from 0 to infinity from a negative 1 to the K. Um, theta to the 2K plus 1 over 2K plus 1 factorial. And so the first term in this thing in terms of theta is going to be theta plus a bunch of other terms. When k is equal to 0, negative 1 to the 0 is 1. Theta to 1 is theta. And then, uh, well, it's 1 factorial on the bottom, which is just 1. So the first term in my polynomial, uh, Taylor polynomial expansion is just theta. So Maclaurin series. Centered where? Centered at 0 particularly theta is equal to zero for sine theta. Why does this make sense to me that this is the following um, Taylor polynomial for sine is because if I plot sine as a function of theta, so this is my theta, this is sine of theta, near zero where I'm using my Taylor polynomial, I do have a linear function, right? So this is my theta. Sine of theta is approximately theta close to the origin. And it makes sense. So as long as I don't veer off too much from the origin, this is a, a very fine approximation to make. So this is called the small angle approximation. So sine of theta is approximately equal to theta. We can also do the same small angle approximations for cosine and r and tangent and stuff like that. But here we're just dealing with sine. So what do I have? Negative g over l times sine of theta is going to be given approximately by negative g over l times theta. And the right hand side is the second derivative of theta with respect to time, my angular acceleration. So this is the equation that I have after I've applied the uh, approximation to sine of theta. And what this tells me is if I put this equation into words is that the um, the two derivatives of theta with respect to time give me a negative constant back and theta so the same function that i started off with and there is a whole course um, on differential equations where you're kind of you go through all of these like mathematical intuitions about what's happening in this equation but i sort of know how to solve this equation already right because i know if i take derivatives of sine two derivatives of sine i get negative sine back two derivatives of cosine i get negative cosine back so this is going to be my theta of t Notice that we couldn't have done this before had we kept sine of theta as sine of theta. Okay, so now theta of t going to say it's equal to either or a combination of both a sine of omega t or b cosine of omega t. So omega um, is a frequency, but um, at this point is just a constant, right? Because we do have a constant of negative g over l popping out, so I need to somehow figure out what goes into the argument of sine and cosine. Right. So based on this, you take derivatives of sines and cosines and you get the negative of the function back. But what happens physically is if my theta is a sine function, I'm not dis displaced from the vertical. If I'm not displaced from the vertical, I'm probably the bob is not going to move at all. So physically, um, theta of t being sine of t doesn't make a lot of sense which is why we're just going to throw it out. So sine of omega t doesn't make physical sense.
And so at this point, we have a guess for what theta of t is, and so let's double check what it is. Theta of t is equal to um, b cosine of omega t. Let's take the first derivative. Theta prime of t is going to be derivative of cosine is negative sine, so negative b omega sine of omega t. Omega comes out front because it's the derivative of the inside, and then theta double prime of t is going to be negative b omega squared. The derivative of sine is cosine, and then the argument stays the same, so omega t inside of cosine. So now let's plug in both sides, and I have that the second derivative of theta with respect to time is equal to negative b omega squared cosine of omega t. That's equal to the left-hand side, which you can sort of see. Negative g over l theta, and theta is b cosine of omega t. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Well, my b's cancel out, so it doesn't depend, um, my, de my equation doesn't depend on amplitude, so that's kind of nice. Cosine of omega t cancels out as well, and I have omega squared is equal to g over l, which means that omega is equal to the square root of g over l. And so this is um, angular frequency. It's the frequency with which my bob um, per periodically moves the angular frequency. We don't have to put words into this. <laughs> we don't have to label everything. Um, and putting everything together, I have that theta of t is equal to some amplitude b times cosine of omega t, and omega is the square root of g over l. And then I have a t on the inside. And so this tells me the motion or the angular displacement of the bob. So now we know a lot of things about, oh, my camera is uh, getting slow. So now we know a lot of stuff about this bob, and because I know the angular frequency, I could also come up with um, an expression for the period of my bob, uh, because we do have periodic motion, and we'll realize that it's just going to depend on the constant of gravity and L. So it's, it's a fixed um, period. It doesn't depend on amplitude, which is interesting, but we do realize that we have taken the Taylor polynomial approximation here, and so this equation is only valid as long as theta is small, as long as theta is approximately zero. So if I move my bob farther out, I no longer have a linear function um, near the origin. It's going to be the full-on trigonometric function that's going to be a different type of um, pendulum called a nonlinear pendulum. Um, so that, I thought this would be an interesting application of the Taylor series or the Taylor polynomial, and um, just, I'll see you in class. <laughs> Let me know if you have questions.